Good morning, Constantine. How are you? Good, thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Well, thank you so much for joining the series of Sentientist Conversations. Um, and it's the first time we've spoken almost in real life, but our online chats before I've laid out that this series of conversations is focused on the two deepest philosophical questions. I, I think the most important ones, uh, what's real, how should we choose what to believe and what matters, so ethics and moral consideration. Um, and I have a clear and obvious bias given the name of this YouTube and podcast and I'm trying to promote and develop a really simple worldview called sentientism, which combines, if you like, methodological naturalism with a sentiocentric compassion. So in, I summarize it as evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. Um, so that's how it answers those two deep questions. But I'm talking to people in these conversations who both agree and disagree with some or all of that. So it'll be fascinating to understand your own personal story and where you've got to now on those questions. Um, but before we get into them, how would you best introduce yourself for people who don't know you? Um, well, just before that, uh, um, thank you for this in invite. And I'm looking forward to finding out if I am a sentientist or not. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure. So, so um, we'll see. I, 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 su I suspect I'm not an enemy of sentientism, but I'm also not sure if, if I am exactly um, um, what, what you've described. So we'll, we'll, we'll find out. But, but my, my background... Um, in in philosophy or from where do, where does one begin normally with these things? I mean, as as much as you like, but normally with the intro, just a, a flavor of you know who you are and what you do now, because the the other questions will I get guess get into a little bit more of life and story and philosophical I, I journey. I normally say I I teach philosophy as university, but as my head of department recently reminded me, I've been on research leave for a few years and and haven't um, <laughs> taught in a while apart from graduate students. So I. I'm a kind of philosopher by trade, I guess. I'm a professor of philosophy at University of Hertfordshire. I have research interests that are kind of, I'd say, unfashionably broad. So I, um, I began as a, um, I guess, philosopher of action. So I'm very interested in human and non-human um, action and its explanation and also its justification and questions of reasons for action, why we do the things we do, and also what reasons are there in favor of doing things or against doing some other things. But I have a more kind of my background kind of before that, when I was an undergrad, was really in Wittgenstein. So I have a kind of philosophical allegiance there of some kind, but also in David Hume, which we will probably come back to with all this reason stuff and also um, sentience. So, so that might be an interesting um, point where our, our ideas might um, juxtapose. Um, so, but I, I've worked on um, all sorts of different things that go well, well beyond philosophy um, of action. Um, certainly vir virtue ethics is one of the things, and that may be something that that's come, will, will come back in a moment. And just the, I don't really work on what's called animal ethics, but but I have sort of been quite interested in what I call anti-vegan rhetoric. So I've written some kind of criticisms for um, for that, and I'm very interested in vegan movements. Um, so so I've done a little bit of work on more kind of language and how language evolves as plant-based um, food. Um, evolves and become more more mainstream um, but any kind of animal ethics I've done is would really just be part and parcel of um, you know virtue ethics or particularism which is something I'm interested in and the same with animal behavior I don't work I'm not an ethologist I don't work particularly on animal behavior but when I do philosophy of action I try to not make the mistake of only thinking of human action and I'm infuriated by philosophers who say things like animals don't act or animals don't act for reasons yeah yeah there's that sort of even in the modern age the level of determination to separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom is brutal and it's, vicious it's pretty radical and even people who set up with I'm not going to do this ultimately try try and find something among my Wittgensteinian friends there's there's a big sort of subpart of them who think animals can't think or can't act for reasons or um 
don't have don't act intentionally in some cases I, I mean as in some people think they never act intentionally and yeah I find that very weird but like you say also that idea what demarcates us from um the animals and in fact what one paper I, I've written is who you know who are we anyway and the use of we to try and um, mark out um all and only human animals and why I don't think that that works. So I think on, on those kind of things, we, we might share quite a lot of views. Oh, fascinating. It would be good to come back to that. And, and, and your work around, I guess, action and ethics and reasons, that I, again, I'm total amateur in this space, but I think it's fascinating in the context of what we're trying to do in these conversations, because as I understand the philosophy of action, it is to some degree about the combination of beliefs, I guess, epistemology, you know, what people think is true, and desires, which I guess is linked to values and, and what matters. So in a sense, it is that bringing together of, you know, what's real and what matters into driving some form of action decisions. And I guess that's part, part of the reason why I think working on and popularizing and sharing worldviews like sentientism, hopefully will be, you know, it's a productive thing to do is because humans have so much power in the world for good or ill and whether we like it or not, those every single decision we take institutionally or individually is framed and shaped by worldview. So if we can have a worldview that's likely to be more accurate and more compassionate, hopefully that's a, you know, a robust, positive <laughs> intervention. But it'll be interesting to dig into some of that. I agree. And I think, I mean, what you said about belief and, and desire, I think, you know, on some kind of very abstract level, it's, it's just got to be true that you know values or, or or needs and wants on the one hand and then how we think the world actually is on the other those combine in some way um of, uh, after that of course there are all these different theories you know do they kind of hydraulically cause behavior or is there space for you know volition and taking responsibility and things um people um attribute this view um, that reasons are combinations of beliefs and, and desires to, to David Hume, who I work on. I don't think it's his own view. I think he's got a slightly more sophisticated view. But nonetheless, it's, it, you know, what, it, it's undeniable that, that what we think and what we want and what we value um, plays a huge role in, in, in how we behave. And that if we get these things wrong, it's going to um, affect our behavior. In, in a bad way well let's let's start with the, the the first part of that um structure i guess what's real and and belief so for many of my guests that's a story about whether they grew up originally in i guess a family and a social context that was more religious or spiritual or supernatural or mystical in some sense or one that was already quite you know naturalistic maybe atheist agnostic more scientific minded um or a combination of the two and then how their philosophy on that side of things has changed over time if it has so yeah you can wind the clock back as far as you like it'd be fascinating to know you know where you came from and where you've got to now on that front i um i'm of uh, greek origin my parents um were and are they're both still alive um uh, greek orthodox i definitely grew up in a very christian um, um background certainly at home but my my father was a diplomat, so we traveled um, really around the world. I was born in India. We were later in Zimbabwe. So I didn't always live in predominantly Christian countries. So I did get a, a bit of um, a kind of maybe wider exposure to different systems of belief while I was growing up. But certainly... Um, it, we you know and and in greece greek orthodox is kind of it's very mainstream there is a separation between state and church but it's it's pretty thin on on certain occasions so it's partly just tradition so my parents in some ways weren't you know we weren't going to church every day or anything like that my mom is actually much more religious now than she was then. If, if, if she was here, she'd say I was always this religious, but certainly <laughs> her religion has taken, and maybe that's true, but it's it's become more Im important in her life maybe um, um, than, than it was um, when, she, when she was younger. Um, but I was definitely brought up um, 
kind kind of Christian, but kind of um, when we were in, I, I mainly didn't live in Greece. So in religion classes, I'd be put in, my mum always preferred um, Protestant to Catholic because the Orthodox are closer to, to the Protestants. But it was interesting, like at school when I was sort of, sort of um, late primary, early secondary school, we had a choice between Catholic, Protestant, and something called ethics, which is for people who weren't religious. And I was not, I was put in Protestant. My mom had a fear of this kind of, this atheist stuff. Yeah, and I, I my best friend, influence. my best friend who had a, yeah, exactly. He had a, an atheist background and he was in ethics. And it was always this, oh, what are they doing in this, this ethics thing? And I, I guess by the time I was a teenager, maybe this is fairly common. I was maybe agnostic, just thinking about these, these things. And my first degree was actually philosophy and theology. Um, it wasn't in, entirely by choice. Um, I mean, you couldn't do straight, straight philosophy. I was at St. Anne's in, in, in Oxford. And I, I think I initially wanted to do philosophy, psychology, and physiology. So this interest in action and explanation was, but you needed math A level for the psychology statistics, which I didn't have. And I just wanted to, you know, get in and do philosophy. So I did it with theology. I think it's fair to say by the end of that degree, I was um, atheist. Um, it was it was something about well, you it was learn. actually the yeah. yeah, the teachers, the um the, the tutors were really honest. I mean, they were religious people. They were they, most of them were reverence for 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 the theology, but they treated you know the the Bible as a historical text. And I found out a lot about um, you know when and why it was written and the politics of the time. And you know the more and the influences of earlier you know Hellenistic culture on it. And, so, and the more you read about it, and the more you read it as a human text set in these, I think it's a part of it is very fascinating set in these historical times. Yeah. You, there was none of this, this is the word of God coming from these people. It's not that they weren't religious, but it was, there was a kind of, you know, very honest approach to, to what this was. And, and I guess at the same time, I was, um, um, it was very funny. I had one semester, one term when I was doing Christian moral reasoning um with Nigel Bigger of all people which we won't get into and then Nietzsche for my philosophy in the same um, um term so that that was quite an interesting um and it was that world where you know Swinburne was around and then on the other hand there was quite a lot of you know radical utilitarian atheist stuff and and Nietzsche and and so on and I guess the Wittgenstein um when I got into that um and a bit of Kierkegaard I I guess I think I, I'm not one of these Dawkins style atheists. I guess I kind of think this is a question of faith rather than reason, something you, you may disagree with, something we may talk about in a moment. And I just don't have this faith. I don't look down on people who who have it. I'm not particularly, I'm not critical of them. I might be critical of particular um you know ethics that that come with a set of religious dogma or something but being religious is nothing i don't think of it as problematic in any way i in some ways have a lot of um admiration for it but it's it's not me i it's not something i i feel i need but it's also not something i think i could choose you know it's just if i had it i'd have it and i don't so um Sorry, that was a long, long answer. No, it's a great answer. Thank you. A fascinating journey, and it's um, it's interesting because I've I've spoken to people who maintain religious belief today in these conversations. Some who've left an established religion, become you know fairly agnostic atheists, but then found a path to something that is maybe spiritual but not religious later in life. But most of them have followed a you know path similar to mine, just out of religion and then stayed basically naturalistic and. You might call it extreme agnostic or an atheistic stance. You know, I just don't see compelling evidence for this thing, so I don't believe it's real. Um, but it's been interesting for the people who've moved away from a religious worldview because it sounds like for you and many of them, it was more about 
you know, evidence and reason and, and facts and just starting to see this thing is much more likely to be a human construction, learning about other religions, you know, and just not finding the evidence compelling, if you like. But there's also a group of people who actually came at it a different way. They were sort of ready to continue with the supernatural and just the faith, but they saw enough of some of these ethical problems that sometimes, not always, sometimes flow through a religious belief. And it was more the ethics that made them start to question. So they looked at, you know, the concept of hell and thought, mm, doesn't sound too consistent with a compassionate, you know, or loving God or, or more practical human stuff, you know, homophobia, sexism, uh, anti-Semitism, what, whatever it might be. And they were like, you know, so it was more the ethics that led them to question. Is that fair to characterize yours as a bit more about, you know, the fact base and the, and the evidence? Um, sort of, I think, I think, uh, I mean, to, to be fair to sort of my, um, the, the way I was brought up, I mean, they were, my parents were never sort of anti-science religious people. The science was taken very, I mean, they weren't scientists, but science was taken very seriously. My, my dad is not a theory philosophy person. He's a fact guy and he takes scientific fact very seriously. So, so I think, um, you know, certainly, um, while, of course, you know, if you start talking about the afterlife or God or this, that and the other, they, they may have um, fairly, fairly strong um, beliefs, but they don't kind of infiltrate um, um, the other stuff. So it wasn't like there was a huge change from, from that. In many ways, everyday life was very, you know, nat naturalistic. And I think it's also fair to say that culturally i'm very christian i've got I, you know my just kind of anything from you know my idioms my metaphor you know i'm 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 very christian culturally and i think there's a lot of good stuff there but like you said you can also find a lot of um other things and i i find it fascinating when when you you know i have friends who are very religious who um sort of distance themselves from those aspects of religious texts as as one should um but i've never fully understood what you think the text is if you think it's wrong and why you're still re and i guess when when i did the theology it made a little more sense because it was this idea that i don't share this view but it was this idea that um they um they believe in god but they don't think god wrote this text and fallible humans wrote it and they that it shows signs of the time they were in and so on. So I think there are ways of remaining religious and, you know, separating yourself from those aspects. But for me, I, I just don't, you know, I just don't have the, um, that, that faith. I'm not, I, I said, I'm, I'm not a hard or new atheist because I, I don't think, I think there are things we can't explain. I don't think God is the answer is an explanation of them. Maybe it's, it's it's not bad as a name for something we can't explain. So you, you know, I don't think Big Bang solves all the mysteries about how the, the universe began or if it did indeed begin at any time. But neither does does God. So there's a kind of you know stalemate maybe, and maybe there's just something we just don't understand. Um, yeah. But that's not and, and that's that's one of the things I find frustrating sometimes about the tone of people who put forward a scientific worldview, because the tone implies that we sort of have all the answers and we've done all the experiments. Yeah, and, 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 I, and it's and very that, and arrogant. It's very arrogant. And, and it's also the complete antithesis of a scientific worldview because the heart of a scientific naturalistic worldview is doubt, uncertainty, always being open to new evidence and, and not being worried by not knowing something, being excited by the opportunity of finding out. And as you said, you know, not making up an answer in the meantime, right? So, so I do find exactly. it odd when that tone yeah. conflicts so strongly and creates i think a, you know a tragic impression of what a proper scientific naturalistic world you should be like and science improves and it, it it's not a reason to to question it but it does get things wrong and then improves it using you know those the same methods um refined and 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 so on and to think it's all been i mean obviously they don't think there's nothing left to solve but there is a kind of when it comes to those questions there's a kind of don't worry we're good and 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 so i i find that at best kind of distasteful but it doesn't mean i'm you know, i'm you know ready to sign up to my local <laughs> yeah. church or anything <laughs> yeah makes sense and what was that process did you find that sort of natural straightforward intellectual comfortable process or was it were there difficulties about i guess becoming atheistic whether that's intellectually emotionally 
socially, family? Uh, because I've spoken to people for, you know, for me, it was a pretty straightforward, easy path because religion was never really a powerful, intrusive part of our lives, similar to yours. You know, it was almost a, a separate part, compartmentalized. But for others, you know, they've had some really difficult, challenging journeys that in some cases even put them at, you know, very severe yeah, physical I'd risk. Yeah, in, 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 intellectually, it was far more straightforward than socially. Not that it was a nightmare socially, but intellectually, it was straightforward to the point where, I, 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 you know, and this is, I don't know if this is common or rare, but I know the precise second I switched from a, agnostic to, to atheist because, and I don't, yeah, it's very weird because I generally don't think arguments persuade philosophers that much one way or another. But you, I, I was in a lecture and I had a, a philosophy of religion lecturer who basically so, um, sort of said um, something like, you know, just because it's possible something exists and you can't disprove its existence, that doesn't mean you're agnostic about it. And he says, you know, for all I know, there's a three-headed dragon in some other galaxy. Am I agnostic about whether there's a three-headed dragon? And he just says, no, because I just, don't, it's not part of my belief system that there might be. I don't believe that there's such a thing so i'm an atheist in regard to that or an a dragonist or whatever yeah, and, yeah. and i kind of at that point i kind of thought yeah what is this agnosticism it's not really playing uh, and, and and i kind of became atheist that that second later yeah. when i it's this almost was as if before, there's, you know, there's, a, yeah. there's a functionally infinite number of things exactly without evidence that you could choose to believe in but and we don't walk around being agnostic about all of those because you wouldn't be able to function properly <laughs> yeah, if that was yeah. part of full time um, job. So why should this be any different? Exactly. And so, so that that was kind of important. But it was only later that I started more the philosophy of language and what does it even mean to say I believe in God or I don't believe in God and is this what, what kind of statement is God exists anyway and so on. So after that, it's not that I became less atheist, but I kind of started to sort of think well people use these words in different ways and it's it maybe is not as straightforward what what they mean with um so socially you know to this day i mean you know my family they'll have lamb on easter day and so on and i just i just don't partake in these things anymore uh, i used to for a long time still go to um church on um kind of um just before easter sunday at midnight um i had i had one when i had a case when i was about 20 i had really long hair and in, and in greece you you'd light this this candle you know you light the sort of holy light at midnight and my hair caught, caught fire and i thought oh, i are. really don't i don't belong here it's <laughs> a sign it's a like, sign it's a sign it's a, an atheist sign. There you go. Um, but um, occasionally, you know, I visited relatives in Canada five years ago and I was staying with them and it was Easter and obviously I didn't eat any lamb, but I went, you know, I, I, so I occasionally go, but um, been a while and culturally, you know, I kind of, it wasn't a, that, unlike that, that moment I just described in the lecture, this was much more gradual and it's just one one of these things and it's maybe i mean certainly during the pandemic it's not as big a deal because there aren't those kind of occasions um as much but and yeah I and i think that's, i think that's more common than people realize is that even within most religious communities i think there are large numbers of people who don't really hold to the supernatural beliefs anymore but it's a it's a cultural thing it's a community thing you know something they enjoy they feel part of and and that that continues to play an important role in their life, but they don't right. they yeah. don't naturally hold the supernatural beliefs getting, anymore. Getting married in church, for example, is is the norm in Greece, and it's it's pretty peculiar and complicated to do it otherwise, and that's quite a big difference from um, from the UK, for example. And I I mean I, I I got married here, and I didn't have a religious ceremony, but but. Um, I have a lot of family members who I don't think of as particularly religious who all felt the need to have that. So like you say, that yeah, it's, it's just what you do. It's yeah. not just, yeah, it's just what you do. And there's a sense of 
breaking away from that. And even though I say I'm sort of culturally Christian, I sort of draw the line somewhere. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And I, and I think I'm with you in terms of attitude towards, you know, supernatural or religious beliefs, because I'm a strong believer that people should be able to believe what they like, um, almost regardless of whether it's well-founded. You know, I, I think it'd be better if it was well-founded, but, you know, go for it. If, you, if, it, if it does good things for you in your life, that's, that's fine. Um, and I think at the same time, I'm quite robust about the ethics. So, you know, believe what you like, but don't use that to needlessly or to justify needlessly causing harm or suffering or death to others. And um, I think there are some really obvious things, you know, again, sexism, homophobia and, you know, racism, anti-Semitism that I think, you know, most people in the culture you and I are part of would say, of course, those are bad and we need to get rid of them. Um, but on the one hand, I find it odd that they're still accepted in religious institutions, you know, which often maintain a very formalized homophobia or sexism within their own structures, but somehow they're given a pass. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite open-minded about freedom of belief, but I'm not quite sure why we give religious institutions the, you know, the exclusions from standard modern ethical standards. And I'd like to be tighter on that. But there's also some, some, some other ethical impacts that I think people um, accept but haven't really thought through. And I think you know, the idea of hell is, is, is a, a big one for me, right? This is just such a normal part of not all, but many religious worldviews that if you don't sign up or if you break a rule or if you just have been unlucky enough not to hear about the right answer, you will burn in hell for eternity. And for, for many religious people, that's an allegory and it's not a real thing. But for many religious people, that is actually a real thing. That was created by a deity deliberately as part of the architecture of this universe. So, so there are some you know, really obvious and some more subtle ethical harms that I find myself being wanting to be quite robust and quite sharp-edged about. And that can come across as being quite anti-religious, even though I'm not. So I, I don't know how best to navigate yeah, that stuff, that. really. I get that. And I mean, I'm not, I haven't done a kind of sociological um, study. I mean, my hunch is that in parts of the US, that kind of um, hell view of, of it is far stronger than, than it is in, in England, for example, where I, I, I expect not that many people who call themselves Christian would, would, would think that is, is, is true. But, you know, I've not done a study on this, but that, might, you know, I think. And anecdotally, I think there must be some, something to this, so that there's really different forms. Um, but like you, I think, yeah, I mean, in some cases, you know, I think black church in the US has done way more good than it's done bad. There, there are all sorts of kind of examples of good things coming out of religion. But yeah, I think being, being part of your, you know, th there are some things that are unacceptable and, and why you should get a kind of free pass because you know your religion says x y z there i i think i'm um completely with you um though a lot of these things historically have been as prevalent in very atheist societies and if you look at ussr and china and cuba on homosexuality and so on so it's not that this stuff is necessarily tied to to religion and i i think it's equally true that some people um would turn a blind eye because they otherwise agreed with the politics um of of a, of a certain country and i remember i used to read a lot of kind of beat literature when i was younger and was really into still am really into Allen ginsburg and he's got all this stuff about visiting cuba and as as a um, gay person um you know and he had a lot of criticisms of, of that stuff and he could maintain his kind of socialism while saying hang on a minute that what is going on here you do so i do i do think that stuff you know it's easy to think of religious examples but you can find a lot of atheist um, um a, a, a examples of this and anti-semitism of course and so absolutely absolutely and i think that's a really important point one is you know this there is so much good that flows through religious worldviews compassion, community, 
um, and so on. And also that, you know, the problems you see in a religious worldview aren't unique to them either, right? So often it's not actually because of the religious worldview. And it's quite interesting because you can, you can find that in some cases, sometimes you can trace the roots of that problematic ethic back to some, you know, original religious text, but often it's just not there. And you start thinking, well, okay, well, then it came from wider societal norms and yeah, it's not, it's not fair to, you know, blame the supernatural belief as a, as a basis for it. So that's a, that's a, that's an important nuance. So before I, I don't want to spend the whole time on, I, I find this topic fascinating, but I did want to touch on the epistemological side because I think it's really common as you talked about your parents doing to sort of almost compartmentalize, you know, in most of my life, we take a naturalistic approach, you know, um, it was sort of obviously, <laughs> you know, when I'm if I'm trying to get to work in the morning, I don't pray for a taxi to turn up. I, you know, book one. So, so naturalism defined, you know, drives most people's lives. But then they compartmentalize a section, if you like, that um, is more one of faith or belief. And again, I'm quite comfortable with that in the sense that if you can compartmentalize in a way that, you know, there isn't too much leakage. I, you know, believe what you like because there isn't really a negative impact on anybody else and it may have positive benefits in your life as well. But I do get nervous that there often can be a, a leakage of that epistemological standard. And so, you know, in I think we've always been living through a post-truth crisis, right? I don't think it's just, just now. But when you think about, you know, QAnon and Stop the Steel and anti-vax and Flat Earth and homeopathy or whatever you want to add to the list, you know, we, we see some obvious problems that do seem to be grounded in the failure of knowledge or a failure of epistemology. And it's, there's still something that strikes me as odd that, you know, our school kids will go into one class and they'll learn about physics and biology and chemistry and evidence and reason and critical thinking. And they might, in many schools in the UK, for example, go into another class where they're taught as fact things that are unfounded. And, I'm, and I don't know if I'm over paranoid, but I wonder if we allow the validity of, you know, non-naturalistic thinking in one space, does it make it harder for us to challenge it elsewhere um, in, our, in our world? Yeah, there's, I, do you know that the Children Act by Ian McEwan, there's this re really, it's relatively recent and it's this kind of law, lawyer who's, who's representing a young Muslim kid and his kind of, um, decision to not receive medical treatment on on religious grounds and there's all the kind of various for i don't want to sort of spoil it but there's all these kind of various forces and and there's going to be a moment where he comes of age and is allowed to make up his um his own mind and and i kind of feel you know on the one hand when it's when it's your choice and it's about you i mean leaving aside you know when you're a child versus an, an, an adult but when if you're a fully grown adult and it's your choice and um there's a sense where even if you think if you or i might think it's unfortunate they were brought up this way at some point you think do we have a right to intervene and force this thing or do people you know and i think if on the one hand um you, you know way more atheists than than religious people are in favor of say assisted suicide or euthanasia if on the one hand we think these things can often be very rational and should certainly be legal then why is it that we want to sort of say intervene in those other cases and of course we may think it is irrational and well i think it is irrational in the other case to end your life because you think blood transfusion is against some religious um, you, you, you know law of god or something but but I do get nervous about, about um, at what point do we say you know we're going to intrude and similarly with with the veil and 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 things like that because you know Western culture has all sorts of other things that are very sexist that we feel well it may be sexist but people are free to wear what they like so there can be a bit of a um, double standard sometimes and it is very um tricky but i think when it comes to harming others then it gets a lot more straightforward and and i really want to draw the line you know very very sharply and and quickly that your religion doesn't entitle you to um to harm others or to tell others that abortion is a sin or to try and make it illegal or i mean that stuff i'm 
you, you know, very, very clear cut. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, I think that's a really important distinction. And it's a nice segue onto our, our second question about ethics and morality, because it's often a question that's put to people with a, you know, a naturalistic or an atheistic worldview. Um, okay, well, where does your ethics and your morality come from? if it's grounded in anything at all. And so so in this section, we tend to ask two crazily broad questions, which is one, you know, what is the grounding of our morality and our ethics, you know, normatively? And again, how how has our view on that shifted over time? But the second question, which is central to this idea of sentientism is, okay, and in that ethical system, who gets to count, you know, who who matters and, and how do we draw that scope of moral consideration and again how has that changed over time so it's two crazily broad questions but yeah so this is the bit i've been it's the bit i've been dreading because i think it's the (laughs) bit where we might disagree disagree the the most but we'll we'll see and and i'm if i'm right you're not talking about my you're talking about our ethic in some kind that we question again right in in some kind of general sense what grounds morality in general right not where have my values come from which we've sort of talked about already is yeah, that right I th- it's more it's yeah. more it's more the we yeah yeah but it but it, it, it but it varies the way people tell the story because again sometimes that it can have quite a strong personal aspect as well but it but i'm yeah i'm more interested in the i'm interested in the descriptive how as has how has humanity come to have this set of default biological morals if you like but i'm more interested in the normative side of you know right and wrong and good and bad and so I'm a kind of I'm sort of half Humean and half Wittgensteinian on these things, and both are um, I'm going to take a deep breath here. Both are more skeptical of of reason, or at least reason with a capital R, um, than I I think you are, but I might be wrong. So I'll say a little bit about this, but and I think half of what I'm going to say may not chime well with you, but the other half will because they contrast reason. Um, certainly Hume in particular, um, with with care. And and I think care is very close as a concept to to some of the things you've been talking about, and it's going to be highly important in this ethics. Indeed, ethics of care, which Annette Beyer was one of the pioneers of, comes from her readings of Hume to some degree and and so on. And and in Hume, we we get this this, um, kind of famous phrase, you know about reason being um and 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 it ought to be the slave of the passions and and you know we we won't do exegesis here but you can imagine different interpretations and what does this mean and why would you think this um but i think i think one thing that comes out from um from hume that i agree with is that if humans and other animals and he talks a lot about um other animals um didn't care didn't have feelings um, didn't care about anything, ethics wouldn't be the way it is. So if we were just robots that were kind of programmed or whatever with categorical imperatives, right? And this is, I mean, he's obviously writing before Kant, but um, that ethics, you know, whatever it was, it would be very different, some kind of system of, of laws because they were useful or something. And even there, the use, you know, you've got to care about something for something to be useful. Um, so for Hume, it starts. I mean, he's he's a kind. He's not utilitarian, but he's a kind of pre-male consequentialist in, in, to some degree. And I don't fully agree with that side of things. But obviously, feeling care is about more than just feeling pleasure and, and pain. But that's part of it for Hume. So sen- sentience, um, and it's it's that kind of idea that. Um, we are the kinds of beings, as are most, if not all, of non-human animal kingdom, um, who care when they are in pain and care when someone else is in pain and care about other things. Justice, he writes a lot about justice. It's not just the pleasure pain thing. We care about equality. And the thought is, the idea, um, um, Mark Schroeder has written a great book on this called Slaves of the Passions, where I kind of, he's out to defend human. When I first read it, I was reviewing it, actually. I thought, this is going to be crazy. And by the end, it makes sense because it's not about every um, ethical truth requires a desire behind it. Um, that, you know, we, there's all sorts of duty where you have to do things that you don't want to do. It's that if we had no desires 
at all in the world, if there was no such thing as desire, ethics couldn't take hold, at least not in the way it does. And so for me, reason is important, but it has to come after. So you start with sentience, feeling, pain, desire, need, care. And with those in place, of course, then there's the question of what's rational and, and what isn't. And it's not just that it's not that reason is purely instrumental. Oh, you want this and reason comes and tells you how to get it. Reason can tell you that you shouldn't want this, but the reason why you shouldn't want it is ultimately going to be because there's something else we care about. So it's, it can't be reasons all the way down. And that's a very Wittgensteinian thing as well. And in, Wittgen, in the Wittgenstein version of this, there's something very animal and primitive at, at the basis and the reasons come after. So it's anti-rationalistic in that you can't just, if, when reasons come to an end, you've got something very primitive, the fire burnt me. And that's a reason for not putting my hand again. Why? Because I don't want to get burnt again. Yeah, it's not, it. there's that's nothing, it. Yeah. that's it. That it, it can't be reasons all the way down. It's that you care about not getting burnt. Um, so, so for me, um, both, you, you know, human Wittgenstein, not, not, not known for being particularly great on animal rights or anything, but what they both realized is that this thing that a lot of human philosophers try and separate humans from other animals and put reason as this big thing that separates us. And they both say, no, we're far, we're far. It's not that they say animals have a lot of reason. And they don't deny that they might reason. And Wittgenstein talks about squirrels and so on in this in this regard. But it's more that we're not as rational as we think. We're in some ways more like animals, but not in more like non-human animals, but not in a bad way. It's not that we're irrational. It's that so reasons come from these shared um, behaviors and and desires that we have with some um, of, of of the other animals. Um, and of course, we might develop our own practices around that, and that may give rise to to new reasons and 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 so on. So I don't know. Does that kind of yeah make sense to you? Yeah, it, it does. It does. It's really it's really interesting. And um and in in a way, one of the things I've tried to do with this sentientism idea, which I didn't come up with, it, you know, it's a term that's been around since the nineteen seventies, but it's been um I guess part of the animal ethics and animal advocacy literature for a long one. It hasn't really got a broader um airing i've tried to do two things because the the original use of the term was really it was it was in a naturalistic context but that wasn't part of the story it was really um equivalent to sentiocentrism so it was really just about setting our scope of moral consideration and saying look all sentient beings have the capacity to suffer so we should care about them so it was really that was the center of it although it was framed naturalistically you know and sometimes explicitly in opposition to we should care about things that have souls or we should care about things because you know there's a supernatural rationale, or you know. So it was trying to set out a naturalistic ethic, but I guess the, the two things I've tried to do in this um, recasting of the idea, one is um, to be explicit about that naturalistic stance. So in the same way as you might say, you know, secular humanism is a naturalistic version of anthropocentrism. You know, it's it's sort of saying humans matter and human morality is sufficient in its own right, but we also have a naturalistic way of understanding the world that isn't religious or supernatural. You could see sentiocentrism and sentientism as, you know, sentientism as the naturalistic version of sentiocentrism. So that's why I'm trying to frame it, frame it that way. But the, um, the second thing that I think is important, because many of the people who talked about sentientism and sentience um, in the modern era, people like Peter Singer and Richard Ryder, came from a sort of utilitarian school of thought and have carried that through in different flavors um but i quite like the approach of saying well let's keep this idea of moral considerability scope neutral on the ethical system so i think you could take a utilitarian or a consequentialist approach that recognizes the utility in the experiences of every sentient being you could have a care ethic that grants moral consideration we should care about all sentient beings you could have a virtue ethic that saw it as virtuous to be kind to all sentient beings. Uh, you could take a relational approach that recognizes that every sentient being has the capacity to have a, some form of relation that we should value. Um, so I'm sort of trying to back away from all the difficult topics in ethical systems and just saying the most important thing is we set 
a baseline for moral inclusion. Um, and that moral inclusion would at least mean we'd see it as negative to needlessly cause suffering or death to any of the things in that scope. So in, so in that sense, I'm not, I'm, I'm not pushing this link between the naturalism and the ethics as strongly as you might think. Some, some do. Some think, you know, take a naturalistic, naturalistic epistemology and that drives you inexorably towards a sentiocentric compassion. I'm not necessarily sure that's true. I think to some degree, you know, it's, it's a choice that we may or may not take. Um, others see them as distinct. And in a way, that's partly why I frame it as evidence and reason and compassion for all sentient beings, because they're two choices, right? One is you have to choose to believe based on evidence and reason. Two, you have to choose to have compassion for all sentient beings. But that second choice could come from an emotional place or an intellectual place or, you know, a, a bunch of different ways into it. Uh, but I don't know if that softens it no that's right that's right and i i think you know there's there's obviously a lot there are religious movements especially in india um um where, where you can have the com the compassion for animals and have it very strongly what while um not being that naturalistic in yeah. your um so the i would want and, to leave yeah. yeah and leave a lot of space for that i think like you i'm not I, i'm not a humanist i think humanism it's just way too focused on one animal. Um, I also think it's a it's kind of like religion for people who don't want to believe in God. And for me, God isn't. It's the religion I don't want. You know, if you want to believe in God, that's it's neither here or there. But it, it's it's it's. I find it funny when people like Grayling or whatever want to write secular Bibles and so on. And it's it's not for me. Like like you, I want to keep things broad. If you know a broad kind of church i'm not utilitarian myself i'm more between the care and and virtue stuff but yeah what's fundamentally important is you, you know not harming uh, other beings um first do no harm if we come to what matters i would say you know first do no harm and that's the reason why i'm not at least a certain kind of utilitarian where you might try and harm for the greater good but I do find it very, to get kind of a bit more polemical, I find it very puzzling how something like being against harm done to animals is considered radical in our day and age. Like, you know, if, if, you're, and if you just decide, I don't want to eat any products that, um, you, you, you know, whose creation involves the harm of animals, how much hatred you can get for that view it's something i i really struggle to kind of fully comprehend i think you know i can understand why some people might not choose a plant based path but it's it's the vitriol as if this and and even even the people who think this is all well and positive might nonetheless think it's there's something really radical about it and I just kind of think, what's so radical about not wanting to harm beings that feel pain or indeed to kill them painlessly or otherwise? It's my thing. <laughs> I, I, I tweeted something out the other day. I said, you know, if, if, if vegans are about trying to reduce the suffering and death we cause, what exactly are anti-vegans campaigning to achieve? It's, crazy. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's and it'll, it be interesting, and it'll be interesting to know your story on that front because I, I, I think, share this frustration because, again, I'm a total amateur when it comes to philosophy. But as you said, when you look back at um, Hume, particularly Bentham, you know, and, and you can go a long way further back from that, hundreds, thousands of years, this idea about having some sort of care and consideration for non-humans is deeply ancient. You know, as I said, it goes back into... Jainism and Buddhism and Hinduism in terms of the Himsa. It go, comes through some of the secular um, Greek philosophers. One of my favorite is a, a blind Arab philosopher called Al Mari, who lived at around the year 1000. And he was explicitly naturalistic. You know, he was ripping shreds off religious worldviews and the idea of a God. But he was also essentially vegan at that point and talking about the harm caused through meat and dairy and so on. Was, you know, maybe he was like a proto sentientist in the year 1000. So these are ancient ancient ideas but in the philosophy in the philosophy despite you know bentham said you know the question is can they suffer i mean that's pretty fundamental but the bulk of certainly moral philosophy seems to have just 
sort of conveniently forgotten that and drifted back to a really powerful default of anthropocentrism. And it's not true everywhere, um, but I do find that frustrating. So what was, so what was your journey to, you know, recognising the moral salience of non-humans? And again, was that a difficult, yeah, fast it was or slow difficult. path? It was slow, difficult, partly shameful in many ways. It, um, but, but I, and there's, um, just before I get onto it, um, Aristotle's students, the- Theophrastos, is a ve- very early vegetarian slash vegan. It's very hard to know exactly what his his diet was. Who uses Aristotle's natural philosophy, but you know, stops short of these big distinctions between re- you know, and argues against Aristotle on animal argues that animals can reason and 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 so on and so forth. Um, I you know, cu- culturally, I mean, I I uh, we were we, we were a, a meat eating family uh, my my parents were never kind of um gung ho about that I, I have an early childhood memory of when our vegetarian friends came for dinner and you know it was always oh these people are vegetarians so we're going to cook this food and it wasn't sort of the bloody vegetarians are coming this was like in the early 80s or something yeah. um but and i you know i i rem- vaguely remember asking you know that moment when you realize this is that animal is on my plate, but the but it didn't you know I can't remember the exact answer my parents gave, but but I didn't go vegetarian at that point and and in fact, I mean when I was an undergraduate I was in a shared home with um, I think there were four of us and the other three were vegetarians or one maybe one pescatarian a vegan and a vegetarian kind of thing and I just I just didn't do it. And I kind of, I came to moral philosophy quite quite late, actually, because I was mainly studying philosophy of mind and history of philosophy and, and things like that. Um, and when I then started sort of teaching um, ethics as a graduate student, I was teaching a lot more animal ethics suddenly um, and getting to understand it better. And I was you know, a lot of the arguments were from Peter Singer and consequentialism and the clever, but it wasn't really my thing. And it was actually reading. So I was teaching um, a book by Rosalind Hursthouse. It's a sort of semi-edited book, but she writes quite a lot, long introductions. I think it's called Human and Other Animals. And it was a more kind of um, virtue ethics approach to um our relationship to um indeed the environment as well as, as other animals and she came and gave a talk at reading where i was at the time as well um and it really persuaded me and i went i went vegetarian not vegan at that point vegan was considered radical and one one thing i've i've sort of and i think i persuaded myself for ages i had this view i was a kind of vegetarian but i drank soya milk I use plant-based and I had view that it was all about minimizing dairy, that if only we, we just took a little bit, we could do it without harming anyone or something like that. So I was this kind of half house between um, kind of veggie and vegan for a, ve- a very long time. And uh, when I met Rosalind Hurst house, and we, we, we went to dinner and she was eating veal and I had this kind of... <laughs> never meet your idols and and she gave me this you know she'd been veggie for like 30 years and then she came and she'd moved to New Zealand and told me oh but the farming conditions are so much better here and and the veal is and I I I don't know maybe she's she's gone back again but I had this moment and I kind of thought I owe so much to this person at the same time as but what are you doing here it was very awkward for me and and I and um very nice person we had a really great conversation and a great philosopher but i couldn't quite you know it was a very awkward mo- moment for me but i've been i think i've had vegan. quite a few of those i've had quite a few of those yeah. moments even in these conversations where you you talk about all the ethics and you completely agree and then they they recognize haltingly that they haven't put it into practice but um and, yeah. and that they've been eating me to i mean that yeah i can a lot of people who say they love animals just well, and, I, don't and know, I, would have, I would have been one of those people not not so long ago so um yeah well yeah. it's and i i think 
That's right. And I think, you know, it's not about being judgmental about these things. It's, it, it's only when I get attacked for crazy, you know, for kind of radical views that, that I feel um, that I get, get on the defensive. Um, and yeah, I think I've, so I've been veggie for, I don't know, over 20 years, but vegan only for maybe five of them or something like that. Almost exactly the same. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and it's an interesting, it's an interest, it's quite an old school journey because a, a lot of kind of millennial vegans, they go from meat to vegan, which is very impressive. Um, and I've had this kind of slower, maybe slightly more old, old, old school journey, um, um, which is a little different. And I guess a lot of contemporary vegans are very in, environment um, sort of based. And you know, it's not that I think those are bad reasons, but for me, the animals, you know, it's a vegan for the animals, as they say, yeah, is, yeah. is my main reason. And, and there's reason. part of the dynamic here, in my mind, links to um, you know, how people think about philosophy, not just philosophers, but, you know, people in general. And um, it feels to me that most of philosophy, and you can understand why, most of moral philosophy is focused on the moral agent, if you like, you know, us, really, humans. Well, I would argue that if we have agency, many other non-humans do as well. But, but it's this focus on the agent because we want to decide, we want to take decisions and we want to work out what the right or wrong things to do are. So that's understandable. So you can see how, as you said, you know, a virtue ethics about acting virtuously um, or a, you know, deontological system where, you know, there are rules or, or, again, guiding our action. So a lot of the focus is on the moral agent, the moral agent doing the right thing. And, and I think that's, that's important. But there's a danger to me that le leads into this problem of non-human animal ethics. Whereas if our focus is totally on the agent and we assume that humans are the agents, it's very easy to forget about the consequences. And as you've said, I, you know, I would almost define morality as we have to, it's about caring. It's about caring about ourselves and at least some others. And if you're caring about others, almost by definition, you are caring about their perspective and the consequences for their perspective so i wouldn't necessarily you know I, I tend more consequentialist myself um but at the same time i do see the value of i like the consequentialist approach because ultimately that's what matters to me it's the suffering the flourishing of the individual sentient beings and in a sense those are consequences and that's why i want to take better decisions um in a sense if i if i take a good decision but all of the outcomes are negative that's pause for thought. But at the same time, I think the utilitarian approach to consequentialism sometimes focuses so much on, or feels like it focuses so much on aggregates or, you know, um, you know, totals and averages. And, and it, it sort of, it's quite cold in a way. It can be quite cold and it sometimes feels like it forgets about the individual. I don't think it has to, and I don't think it should. Whereas, you know, the virtue ethics and the deontological stuff and the care ethics brings the focus back to the individual. So Again, that's partly my excuse for suggesting a super pluralistic approach that um, you know just sets the scope of moral consideration. Because I, I heard you, I think I'll paraphrase it from a different talk you gave, where you were saying maybe virtue ethics is useful in thinking about acting rightly or wrongly, but consequentialism is useful in terms of you know assessing doing the right thing. What is the right thing? What was the right thing? And and the outcomes. And I I quite like that approach of saying we need both. But if we just focus on the agents. And we forget about the moral patients, then we can enable ourselves to do awful harm. Yeah, and I think I mean I completely agree with you. I mean, consequences matter a lot. You know, there's a separate question: Are they the only thing that matters? And yeah, part of what I was doing there was to say, well, th the answer to that to that is it depends what we're interested in here. If you're interested in, um, you know, what is the right thing to do then maybe some forms of consequentialism might give you everything that matters. I'm not completely convinced because of these problems about sacrificing minorities for majority good. And uh, so I'm a little worried about um, justice and consequentialism, but maybe some form of rule consequentialism could get over that. Um, but, but, but when it comes to the reasons why we do things and how we're acting and if we're acting well and so on, there for me the virtue stuff kicks in and you might do the thing that happens to have the best consequences but do it from all sorts of vicious motives 
Um, so, so you morally is one thing and, and the things you do and what you ought to do is, I do like to, to kind of separate the, these two things up, up to a point. And I find it helpful to also be less judgmental towards others and ourselves when we do the wrong thing, for example, because you want to look at, well, why has this happened? And was this agent acting reasonably well? Um, um, and, and so on. Um, so, um, but maybe Hume is the philosopher for you because he's a consequentialist, but he's also a virtue ethicist and he believes in care. It's, but you know, he's not as fond of reason as you are. So I'm going to try and push you towards <laughs> you bring, being a little more, more closer to Hume. Maybe you'll bring me, bring me around, bring me around. Well, that's, 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 that's my big, my, my goal. That's your plan. My secret goal has been to bring me around to that. Um, that's fascinating. Thank you. And what before we move off this question of what matters, you mentioned that um, you know many people are coming to veganism and thinking about the animal question because of environmental concerns and, and climate as well. And um, so some people will criticise a sentientist stance because they say it's gone too far and we should be more uh, deliberately more anthropocentric um, and focus on humans as the priority, sometimes the only priority. Uh, others will criticise sentientism from the other side. And the first time I think the term was used was... Um, it was used in a critical sense. It was actually coined by a guy criticizing um, John Rodman. And he was looking at Singer, Singer and Ryder and the Godloviches and Brophy and others who are talking about animal and sentience and saying, look, this sentientist worldview is discriminating against non-sentient stuff. You know, what about rocks and rivers and plants and trees and all of those other things, which we know are important because of the environment. So, what, you know, why stop at sentience? So what's, what's your thoughts on yeah ecocentrism biocentrism holism and sort of going beyond yeah, the capacity to suffer in, you, you're going to get me into trouble jamie <laughs> so so i don't i don't really see how you can harm a rock or be unjust to a rock um i think you know obviously a rock isn't alive and i can see how you know just you know, if there's like a bed of roses somewhere and I just go with a lawnmower and just kind of, <laughs> that seems nasty. Um, and there's a sense where even Aristotle would say you've harmed the flower, you've stopped it from flourishing um, as it should. And I think there's something to be said for that. And, you know, if you said there were no sentient creatures on earth, but you can have nothing or a planet with water and trees and so on, you might think, well, I'd be mad to go for nothing. But but really, you know, I think why it really matters to me is the ecosystems of sentient beings are around it and their environment. You know, on the one hand, I certainly don't think the environment is valuable just because of humans. In many ways, it would be better off without humans. But if you said, you know, remove humans and all sentient creatures, that that seems to me you've lost you know the most important thing. Does it's does it count for nothing? No, I think it's got a value. Obviously, if no one can see it and no one can hear it and no one can interact with it, its value is going to be reasonably minimal. You know, we think it has a value because we imagine ourselves looking at it, right? But th there'll be no one there, in there or out there, to sort of look at it. So if you're imagining it completely on its own, kind of famous thought experiment it's it's very hard um um to to do um and so for me you certainly don't preserve that at any cost <laughs> if if there was such a moral dilemma at any point i wouldn't be preserving that at the cost of all sentient creatures so maybe i am a sentientist i don't know <laughs> I'm, bringing, I'm bringing you around i'm bringing you bring you around but but i think well, I'm, you I'm... win some you lose some <laughs> I, so I'm in I'm in, I'm in a similar place. So I'd I'd see um, uh, you know, non sentient stuff as being I guess instrumentally valuable because of its impact on the sentient beings, and that's in terms of ecosystem services and aesthetics and you know all the pleasure that we and other sentient beings might get from it and the survival value as well. So I you know I'd share a rich concern for our environment um, with an ecocentrist. Um, but again, to and and some sentientists do go beyond sentience. But the critical thing for me is that we grant more serious moral consideration for every individual sentient being. So if you want to go beyond that, that's fine. My primary concern is the exclusion of any sentience. And, and frustratingly, it does seem like that is the center of gravity of most of the modern environmental movement, is that it's really, I think, a veneer over 
an anthropocentric stance, right? Because the reason people care about the environment is because, you know, we want a stable temperature, we want a nice environment, and we want nature to be pretty to look at, really. Um, and what gives the light, not everybody is in that mode. Some people genuinely and deeply do grant more consideration to those things. But what gives the lie to it is when someone who has an expansive ecocentric concern for ecosystems and habitats and species and rocks and rivers and trees and the earth has Gaia, but still explicitly excludes practically, you know, many millions or billions of sent very obviously sentient beings from moral consideration. And that's not just in farms, that's in the wild as well. So, you know, the the default environmental response to you know, many challenges is to just kill stuff. So, um, <laughs> so I find that I find I, I find that frustrating, where it's a sort of pretense of a really generous ecocentric view, but actually it's a an echo. But of all the deer have been have been shot or whatever. Yeah, for the sake of their population, you know, dynamics. Yeah. It's like oh, okay. I mean, and we haven't. I mean, maybe this is not for now, but yeah, I think that preservation the preservation of the species over the individual and that kind of valuing the species above the individual is something that. That I'm very uncomfortable um, with, but perhaps in some ways we're all three quarters kind of watered down Aristotle because we do agree that there's a difference between the rock and the plant and the plant and the sentient being, and then we might stop short of saying the difference between humans and other sentient beings is reason or something like that or language or all these different um, attempts maybe self-deception would be a better a better but the you know what um, though i'm sure there's chimps who can deceive themselves or whatever. but but um but yeah so maybe there's something to to that up to a point but of course it doesn't justify you know killing the, these things um so yeah i think we're i'm quite close to you on on this stuff about it's fine to go further but but you don't get to do that at the expense of, of a sentient being and you don't get, you know, all these kind of ethics of culling. And that's where I guess maybe there are other ways of being consequentialist, but often consequentialist arguments are used um, in the killing of animals for some kind of um, um, broader good. And I get very kind of uncomfortable about that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think we are in a similar place. And I think I think even for someone who genuinely ha does have an ecocentric view and cares intrinsically about rocks and rivers and so on, surely they have to acknowledge that the capacity to experience suffering, you know, is an additional source of value on top of that. So even if you're, you know, your baseline yeah. is broader. Even if you're panpsychist, which I'm not, you ought to, there's going to be a difference of order Absolutely. Yeah. And I was, I was very lucky to talk to, um, I've talked to at least a couple of people who uh, have a different versions of a panpsychist worldview, David Pierce and Luke Rodolphs. And it was interesting because um, sentientism is completely neutral on philosophy of mind. Personally, I'm a sort of more boring materialistic, this is just what this class of information processing feels like to run, that's it. Um, and th they have a different view that um, in some sense, consciousness is in intrinsic in, in everything. But it's interesting because while that might seem a radically different philosophy of mind, they both in practically ethic, practical ethics terms ended up in a very similar place to me because they recognise that, you know, if there is something it's like to be an electron, it's radically simple. Um, and even if you think it's conscious in that definition, it still probably doesn't have the capacity to suffer or experience suffering or flourishing. So in that sense, it would actually be conscious, but not sentient. So, so in essence, you know, they're quite comfortable ethically cutting into a carrot to feed themselves, but not cutting into a pig to feed themselves. So they actually end up in a very similar place, regardless of the philosophy of mind. Um, but that's so, so the one thing sentientism is irritatingly neutral on is philosophy of mind. The other thing it's irritatingly neutral on is which entities are sentient. So it doesn't have a sort of list of species or things. It just says, well, Follow a naturalistic approach, you know, prudently, provisionally, probabilistically look at the evidence. Now, so so again, sentientists disagree over where that boundary is. You know, again, I'm I think pretty much in line with the scientific consensus that it's humans, you know, non-human animals, maybe some of the simplest invertebrates. You know, there are question marks over, and um, you know, I, I draw the line at plants because I think they can, if you like, be harmed or they can flourish, but they can't. Ex it doesn't seem that they could experience those things. Um, so um, I draw the line there, but other sentientists will disagree. So in a sense, I'm 
sentientism is saying, look, whatever it is and wherever it is, sentience matters. And that's the foundation of morality. That's but right. there's still quite and a lot can... of disagreement about the fuzzy boundaries. And... Well, dr- yeah, and drawing the line, you know, you've got to draw the line somewhere and that that's no bad. You know, we might not all draw it at exactly the same place. I mean, I don't eat oysters or anything like that. You know, my rule of thumb initially was, you know, if it's got eyes, I'm not touching it. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> but it's just the rule of thumb, you know, I'm open to... Um, scientific discovery on on these things but that was pretty you know um but i don't yeah i don't really go for shellfish or 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 whatever insects snails. i mean so so, my thing yeah so there there are some sentientists that are confident enough in that those things are not sentient um that they're comfortable eating them but i think they're generally rare much rarer i think most people again will follow you and me with a sort of prudent approach that just says Give the benefit of that out and you know up to it up to a certain I, I, point that's it if there can be really strong evidence that says i mean I'm, it might be that for aesthetic reasons i wouldn't do it anyway yeah. it's a bit like i don't feel a particular like, drive to anyway <laughs> well yeah i think that the new the kind of the new debate will really be you know synthetic meat and they'll they'll be the the vegans who kind of have been craving this and think look if no animal was harm i want it and the vegans who just have a kind of almost ethics of disgust around eating that stuff even if from a consequentialist point of view say there's maybe no no harm and i think i mean i don't know the details but by and large i would welcome the the technology if if it moved people from killing animals to eating synthetic meat would i eat it myself who knows i don't like to predict what i would do but i i don't i'm not eager to taste them. i'm not sitting there going oh my god i can't wait for this stuff to come um yeah well but, that's quite, that's a good segue into our yeah. final question and apologies because i'm taking more of your time than i said i would but, um, it's my fault for the long answers so not at all the conversation is fascinating for me anyway um, but the, the, the final question really is about the future um and and i'll let you choose your own classification but i think i'm going to claim you roughly as a sentientist because i think you have a naturalistic worldview and you base your beliefs always haltingly but on evidence and reasoning and you have a at least a sentiocentric compassion that recognizes all sentient beings as moral patients that we should have compassion for so i'm going to claim you anyway for the moment um but but in that context i think you and i would agree on those stances and for me they almost feel incontrovertible and self-evident and maybe that's arrogant or silly because nearly everybody on the planet disagrees with this because whether it's on the epistemology many people do have a fair fideistic faith or even a pretend naturalistic belief that is very poorly founded in many areas of their lives billions of people and we're certainly in a minority when it comes to practically implementing a sentiocentric compassion as well so we're in this weird position where it feels like maybe technically the answers the basics shouldn't really be that hard for 7.8 billion humans to get their heads around but we're in a vanishingly small minority what how does that leave you feeling about i guess the future for humanity and sentientity and the planet and how do you think we can realistically drive positive change given your understanding of the weirdness of human belief and action and thought so i'm sort of i'm s- semi very optimistic um and then semi very pessimistic and i guess i'm i'm quite pessimistic about you know um climate catastrophe so so i think there's there's a there's an environmental thing that it that you know i'm not saying it's too late to do anything about it because being defeatist about it is not a good idea um it's an open question whether it's too late to do anything about it and we damn well better you know hope it isn't and do do what we can but how optimistic I, I can't be, I don't, you know, it's very hard to be optimistic about that. Um, but I am optimistic about, um, I think, the future of, of of treating animals, despite the fact that we're in a, a minority. I think it's a fast growing minority. I, I think people thought veganism was a fad and it isn't. I think once the big, you know, whatever you may make of them, once the big companies have realized that they will lose money if they don't create vegan substitutes and so on, once that starts to happen, which it really has, even in the States, let alone here, um, 
um, I, I think um, the signs are, are incredibly good. I think the synthetic meat will, will add to that. It's not going to happen, might not happen in our lifetime. I, I, I think th there are socioeconomic and cultural things that, that, that will prevent it from happening fast. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, subsidies for farmers to transition. You know, I don't want a war with with the farmers and so on. I think this has we have to appreciate, you know, there's villages where um fishing is the only way anyone can make a living. Yeah. You know, we can't just you and I can't just sort of go in and say, no, no, naughty <laughs> yeah. people fishing. So it, yeah. it's very, very difficult. It's not going to happen fast. But but I I I think with the right kind of, you know, with money spent in the right ways. Um, to help things, we can even you know make a real difference. You know, if if even the people who care about humans more than other animals should realize that, you know, you can end world hunger if you redistribute, um, you know, the food the animals are are, are eating and so on. So 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 really, it's it's a win win, but it can't happen overnight. And and it, but I do think it's moving. I don't think it's a fad. I think it's moving in the right direction. I think it requires a lot of cooperation between people who may disagree on very large things, whether they're religious or atheist, whether they're meat eating. I think one thing that I've, be that I've become just really interested in is how increasingly the concerns of a minister for agriculture and the concerns of a minister for the environment are at complete odds with one another. And at some point within any government, you know, there's going to be a realization that this can't carry on. They have to, there's got to be a way to um, appease both. And that's going to involve, I think, agriculture subsidies for people to do what's best for the environment and indeed um, um, animals and, and, and um, human or otherwise. Um, but I think right now there's that tension. You see it particularly in 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 France, where there's a very aggressive, you know, there's a big um, cheese dairies, is you know, it's a huge thing, um, and and so on. So I think these these are complicated matters, but I am optimistic. Should the planet survive? Yeah, <laughs> and I, I I share that sort of guarded optimism because. That, almost whichever topic you look at, there seem to be win-win-win opportunities there. And, you know, obviously there's the ethics, which is the core driver for you and me, when it comes to climate, environment, land use, water use, zoonotic disease, antimicrobial resistance. It's, um, I do worry about my own motivated Health, reasoning. everything. Yeah, I yeah. worry about my own motivated reasoning because my ethical drive is so strong on this topic that I'm looking for all of those reasons. But they genuinely are there, right? It's, so the win-win is big. But I, you make a really important point that we've got to invest in that just transition to help these communities and different groups work through. We can't do what we've done with so many other industries before and just go unlucky. Exactly. We, we exactly. switched off good luck retraining, right? That, that cannot Tough happen. Luck. And, and the picture is radically different as you look around the world as well, because um, like you say, there are communities who don't have a viable alternative at this point. Um, and I've been lucky to talk to some people who are doing some fascinating campaigning work across the Asian continent and the African continent. And they have to build that nuance and that challenge into um, how they're responding and how they're taking things forward. Uh, and in a sense, whereas you know, for the UK and the US and Europe, it's it's really about turning away from industrial animal agriculture and finding more uh, sustainable paths. You know, much of the rest of the world is already much closer to a plant-based future than we are. And in a way, it's just about helping them see that following our path would be a terrible mistake. And actually, they can tap into both sort of cultural affinities for non-human animal ethics, but also advanced technologies that are springing up in these um countries and continents that give them a much better direct path they can bypass the terrible shit we've done and and you know find a way to a much more modern future maybe more quickly than you know the the west does so is it, there's a different dynamic that's exactly right and and the you know the, the the fisherman in the little village is the is the last place to go we've got to sort out our industrial problems first the factory farming and so on and then work down to these other improvements and like you say part of it is is about not not taking the those models 
um, to, to countries and, in, and introducing them. Um, it does get difficult at some point. I mean, um, we have a lot of cats here in the house and, you know, unlike dogs, they can't survive on a vegan diet. Um, but they, you know, the situation is such where, you know, they, they can't go find their own food and live healthy. We have to provide for them. You know, where is that food going to come from? There are complicated matters. Pet liberation is a whole other animal liberation, the very concept of a pet. It's a whole other discussion we've not, you know, you know, um, um, tackled. Yeah. I, I agree. And I, and I think this is part of the, sometimes people will challenge, I guess, both on veganism, but also sentientism and say, look, you don't have the perfect answer to all of these problems. There are complicated, difficult trade-offs. Well, yeah, of course. That doesn't mean we don't try and do better. And I guess my stance is that as long as we do grant moral consideration for all sentient beings, we're more likely to be motivated well to find a better solution. So, yeah. you know, Bonovo, we don't have all the answers. Yeah. So, Bonovo, yeah. for example, have brought out a vegan cat food, and I can't attest to its quality and so on. And, you know, the, whether the cultured meats will come into the pet food space, they already are. You know, so I think we're just more likely to be able to find a better way forward if we have that broad compassion. We take a naturalistic and, and approach. It doesn't mean the, everything's the magically science. fixed. No, it's and that's where the science is very important and you have to follow it because, you know, we have these, you know, I'm sure to my friends, it's absurd when I'm sitting eating mock fish and my cat is eating tuna or, 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 or whatever. And I've got my my chickpea tuna um, and and with with the cat food, I think it really is a science thing. I mean, there have been vegan cat foods. Statistics are not good. A third of cats go have been going blind on on a purely oh, vegan wow. cat okay. food diet. Mm. I mean, this is five years ago. Maybe this is very recent. Maybe it will work, you know, and, and there's worries about how do we test it and who suffers to find out whether it will work and so on. So I'm y y with dogs, it's fine, apparently. So with dogs, it's absolutely fine. Luna is very happy on her V dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, Cats is a little bit trickier, but it's an open scientific question. If it works, it works. But there's, you know, how do we get there? How do we, and, you know, can it be made to work? And if it doesn't, then, you know, these are difficult um, er areas um, to sort of keep thinking about. I need to let you go very soon. But you've talked about the future in terms of climate and environment. You've talked about the future in terms of non-human animals in the context, particularly of farming, but wider exploitation. How do you think... Um, about the future of intrahuman ethics, and do you think they link in anywhere? Or is it just a sort of separate domain that we need to keep working on all the problems? I, I'm a little less optimistic a, a, about that. I don't really follow this kind of line that you know we're so much more rational than we used to be, um, and and so on. I mean, there's you know, in in one sense, you know, you get things that you might look at as as progress. Um, in another sense, I think, you know, there's a lot of modern day slavery out there. There's a lot of, you know, you talk to, I mean, all sorts of forms of, of violence to to women, to people um, of other nations and, and, and so on. Um, I, I'm not particularly hopeful that humans have been moving to, um, and, and, you know, and, and it's trying to reconcile the thought that are we better as humans than people were a few hundred years ago with the thought, with the optimism, you know, how come I'm so optimistic about the plant-based thing? And it's a bit like abolition of, of slavery in certain countries and so on, it, it, um, or at least the one kind of slave. And, and it's, I think it's the thought that, you know, the penny can drop on certain things. We can have a kind of gestalt switch. We can see the world a different way and act upon it but that doesn't mean that we're free of all the other things that makes humans you, you know bad and and good and hu it's not human nature that's changed in 150 years it's it's the way we perceive certain particular um things i think and human nature um, is what it is I like this distinction I, I have between, you know, the, the doing and the thing done, because I, I think it enables us to think better about how people who might have been doing things that we think are immoral in the context of their time and, and so on. And it doesn't mean that the thing wasn't as bad then to do. Um, and, and, and I think um, this, this is going to carry on when future generations um, 
look at us. So I, I'm not, but I'm not optimistic. You know, there's no, there's no evidence to suggest we, we should be optimistic. We've avoided a world war in a decent chunk of time. Brexit, you know, doesn't help with this. I think, you know, one of, you know, the EU had a lot of problems, but it certainly stopped us from, from, from that. As a peace project. And, yeah. Yeah. As a peace project, you know, I'm nervous about all sorts of things. Northern Ireland, as all sorts of things. Yeah, I'm not particularly um, optimistic about how humans are managing their their own affairs. I'm afraid, but maybe you know, maybe there's, I don't know, there's some kind of progress on gender, for example, and so on. We're a long way off, but there's signs of progress. I'd say. Yeah, much still to do. Yeah much still to do sorry a bit of a, a sort of down note yeah we're supposed to finish on a, a cheery optimistic note no not at all not you at know all. <laughs> lgbtq there, there there has been there has been progress but we're a, a, a long way off yeah yeah absolutely yeah. was that a slightly more of this yeah that's better that's better <laughs> and again i think it's part of the balance right we can we can acknowledge that progress has been made because we without if we can't acknowledge that it sort of takes the wind out of ourselves now. And what's the point, yeah. right? If all of those efforts right. were for nothing, then why should we try? And I think there have been progress, but at the same time, that doesn't mean we should be naive about thinking the job is done when it isn't. Mm. Much work to do. So, Yeah, I think you put that very well. well it's, been a, it's been a fascinating <laughs> conversation. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add in before I let you get on with your day? No, it's been really great talking with you. And Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. A real pleasure. What's the best way of people following you, reading your books, uh, learning about your thinking? Um, reading my books, steal them. Um, <laughs> following, following me. Um, not from um, libraries. Twitter. I'm not. Don't steal them from libraries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, um, get libraries to buy them. No. Um, t- Twitter is probably the best. The best place to to follow me. I like it on on there. Um, if you follow Jamie already, then you can somehow find me somewhere. Um, Instagram, only if you like cats, is basically <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my cat. Maybe some vegan food, maybe some vegan food and cats. Um, but yeah, and I try and keep open access versions of at least my papers on online. Yeah, you have a web, your own website as well, don't you? So, yeah, that's great. Well, I will include links to all of those in the show notes so people can. Click right. through and find out more about you. Yeah. It has been a genuine pleasure. Thank yes. you so much, Constantine. I'll let you get on with My your pleasure. day. Bye, Jamie. Thanks.